Pierre Harris, Bill is our sound tech, and PJ is running our graphic system, and our band, of course, today is Becky and Larry and Bill. We give thanks to God. It's a great day here at FLA, and I pray this Sunday is a great day for you and yours. I'll take a minute to wish a few happy birthdays to our congregational family. Is Keela, is Keela at your house today? Keela, it's, it's her birthday. Welcome to her. Happy birthday to Keela. To Virginia Shepherd, happy birthday. And to Heath McCutcheon's son, Emmett. And he tells me he's taking Emmett to North Carolina after this worship service. They're going to pick apples. We do remember also birthdays coming up this week, like Brianna Cartucci and uh, Freddie Harmon and Dan DeWitt. Happy birthday, and that's you, Dan. You're right. Uh, what, 47? Oh, congratulations. Congratulations again. Happy birthdays to our congregational family. Some prayer requests I'll share with you very briefly. Of course, in my personal prayers for Amy Coleman, the Coleman family, and of course, for her father, Wayne, who's been so critically ill for many months now. Healing prayers and strength to you this day. We also have prayers and prayer celebrations. A big prayer circle organized last Friday as Elizabeth Adams' son, Paul, his home was, his community was literally surrounded by wildfires in California. God is good. Paul and his home is safe. Protection for all who are struggling and fighting wildfires in their communities and, well, the western side of our nation. Our sympathy also goes out to Freddie Harmon, our very own Freddie Harmon. His brother Ronnie passed away a, a Friday, and of course Ronnie was a member of our sister congregation, Queens Presbyterian Church here in Newberry. And of course, uh, also sympathy for Kathy Erskine today, her brother in Knoxville, Tennessee. His name is Doug, passed away yesterday. And, and for all who are strugg struggling with grief, loss, sorrow, and direction in their life, our prayers are with you this morning. Go to the Lord 
with me in prayer. If you'd like to pray along, the prayer is in your worship live stream bulletin. I hope you've already printed that, the prayers and the songs. Go to the Lord with me, remembering these names. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, today our prayer is for our country. Our prayer is for its leaders and our doctors, our nurses, our health care providers, for those who are in our local uh, nursing homes like Sharon, uh, Springbrook. And, uh, and we just pray for all of those so lonely, so separated, isolated. Our prayers are with you. Our prayers are with our schools, teachers, families, such decisions they have to make this morning, this week, for their protection. Protection for the youngest and the innocent and of us. For those who work in our nation's businesses and factories, heroes. For those who serve in our military to protect us beyond heroic. For our Christian brothers and sisters together, you that worship all around this world today, the body of Christ is one, and we are so thankful that you are with your body, Lord Jesus, today. We're praying for the vaccine. We know it's coming. Everybody needs it. And I know at the right moment when you have accomplished what you have set to do, that vaccine will be revealed. We look for better days. Better days when we will be closer to one another. May your word take root in our hearts and lives today and help us always to make better decisions. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask everybody saying amen. Amen. Continue your worship today in your tithes, gifts, offerings, the collecting of your gifts. Give God praise, honor, and glory. There's instructions for online giving in your worship bulletin. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, before we offer this sacrifice of worship and praise, I wanted to speak to you about the composer of our next piece. Um, he's, everyone who knows me knows that my favorite gospel musician is the late Andre Crouch. Um, he was very well known as a pianist. He traveled with Billy Graham, um, and he helped a lot of people come to Christ with his music. This particular song speaks to me called Through It All, and I wanted to read to you the last verse, which this rings out to my heart. It says, I thank God for the mountains, and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve them. I never know what faith in God can do. And these words rang out when he wrote them in 1971, and they ring true today that although we are going through our storms, together right now. How many of you guys know my, 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 my poor son PJ, he lives through a storm right now. Um, but we're just so grateful for, for God's blessings and his presence in our life. And so we offer this song um, to you and to God, Andre Crouches, through it all.
today about how you need a real faith, a real faith that really works, even when life all around you has stopped working. You need real faith. You see, a faith that doesn't work for you is a worthless faith. I'm going to uh, call your attention to a story in the New Testament. It's the story of the Apostle Paul, his last journey to Jerusalem, and uh, then his, his last ministries in Jerusalem. And how, how he moved from Jerusalem in his final voyage to his final destination, the city of Rome. And of course, it's a big long story in the book of Acts. More, almost 10 chapters from the 21st to the 28th, 29th uh, uh, chapter. And of course, I can't read all that. So I'll just give you the back story real quick. Paul has just sailed in from the Greek island of Rhodes and Cyprus. He's arrived in Caesarea. He's moved cross-country to the city of Jerusalem. His ministry in Jerusalem brings him for the cause of Christ and the proclamation of the gospel message for the hope and salvation for all. He's around the temple areas and he's talking to people, many who knew him and remembered when he was of the Pharisee sect of the Jews. And he's speaking to them about his conversion, his Damascus Road experience. He's speaking to them about how he forged a living connection to a living Jesus Christ and how that changed everything in his life through it all. And he spoke about how the Old Testament was actually all its religious rituals and religious regulations were all about schooling us to recognize how much you and I, even today, still need a personal connection with the living Savior, Jesus Christ. The temple officials were not too enthusiastic about that message. They saw it as threatening of their, well, of their offices. We're told in the story that they actually get together as the Sanhedrin and they make a promise to one another that none of us will eat solid food, at least while anybody else is looking. None of us will eat solid food until Paul has been extinguished. There's a riot in Jerusalem. There's arrest. Paul is arrested. They take this as an opportunity to bring additional charges against Paul. There's about four chapters where Paul appears before Roman officials to answer these charges of the Sanhedrin. We notice that one of those is the now governor Festus. And we know that Festus was in Jerusalem in 59 AD. And that means we're about, oh, uh, 26 27 possibly years from the time of Jesus' resurrection. It's a true story, historically accurate. And he's there. And in the midst of all the charges, finally, have you ever been in that moment when you're just pressed in at all sides through it all and you realize that God's about to do something great? Maybe you're in that moment today. Paul realized that all of the things that were going on around him, it was God preparing him to go to his final destination to conclude his ministry in the city of Rome. And Paul says, I, a 
appeal my case as a Roman citizen to Caesar. That shut it all down. Immediately, the case would have to be moved to the courts, to Caesar's courts and Caesar's person in Rome. That was a Roman citizen's right. And then the debate in the story, it just shifts. And a whole new group of characters come out that, were, that otherwise we would have never seen. And it's no longer about, you know, the gospel message or the temple message or, or, or this kind of things. Now the new debate in the story is, is it storm season or is it sailing season? Storm season, sailing season. Many saw an opportunity. Okay, one more boat's going to Rome. We can get some more cargo moved. One more boat's going to Rome. I, maybe I'll balance my ledger, the boat owner thought to himself. One more boat's going to Rome. Paul knows what, he knows reality. He's just sailed in from Cyprus. He sailed in. He knew when the sailing season was. He said, you know, we can't go now. It's storm season. I've been out there. I've just come in from the port. The boats are in dry dock. Nobody's going out. It's storm season, not sailing season. Many of them said, oh, well, we'll, we'll get by. And, of course, a majority voted, and the majority said sail. And the story picks up in Acts chapter 7, 27, verse 14. One more slide. Let's see. We've got another slide. There it is. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster sped down from the island the ship was caught by storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Then neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. You've been in days like that? And the storm continued raging, and finally, we all gave up hope that we would be saved. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were lowering some anchors from the bow. And Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you cannot be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For decades, a familiar story, it's always spoken to me about how you get through the stormy days of life, that the secret is you have to remain in the ship, and the ship is your connection with Christ, the church, and the fellowship of God's people, if you're to make it through the stormy seas of this life. And I'm thinking about this and from a new perspective in Corona Summer 2020, and it speaks to me of a faith that works. Paul has a faith. Paul has a faith that works even when life around him is not working. And, and faith should be able to help us specifically make tough decisions easily. Every day you have to make decisions. You analyze the data, you evaluate the potential, you draw the conclusion, you deal with the consequences, you make the next decision. Tough decisions are decisions where one option is not clearly preferable over another option or another. Doesn't have to be a significant decision to be tough. It could be, what am I going to wear today? All of my shirts are dirty except for the light pink and the bright orange one. I hate those two. But it's a tough decision. Nothing really looks, you know, preferable. Which one will I wear? Um, it's tough decisions are when the options before you, they're not really good, they're not really bad, they're not really preferable. It makes it a difficult decision. For others facing difficult decisions, it might be something like so many. Facing a wildfire, facing a, a, a job change, a financial difficulty, an illness in the family. Do we pay rent this month or do we buy medication? Tough decisions. Real faith, that is real faith, I believe should help you make your tough decisions easier. 
What I see in Paul's story is very much like the days, at least that I face right now in Corona 2020 America this morning. People struggling with tough choices. It applies. It's right there it is. I personally look at this story and I've gained new insight about how faith works in our polarized society. How to become more sympathetic with others who have a point of view that might be different than my own. I see in this story of Paul and those making tough decisions that there really are seven reactions that everybody has when they are faced with the crisis of making a tough decision. First thing is denial. People say, it's not my problem, it's not even real, and so I'm just going to go along and going to do what we've always done. And that happens in the story with Paul. A majority gets together and they say, who cares what season it is, let's set sail. And they go out and do the stormy seas. A second way that people, I realize that they um, uh, re react to a crisis of trying to make a difficult decision, there's the dismissal attitude. It's not real. It's no big deal. It'll end fast. It won't last. Somebody comes in and they say, well, storm season, sailing season. The law of averages indicates that if you can calculate how many ships sail on the ocean each year, each day, and how many shipwrecks there are, that means that it really won't affect any of us. And I've gotten by with it before, and I bet you I can get by with it one more time. The captain, the ship owner, that says, okay, let's set sail and go out into the storm. A third way that people um, uh, deal with difficult decisions is defiance. Defiance is, I refuse to limit my freedoms. I know what the experts say. I know what they say about stormy seasons and sailing seasons. I know what I'm supposed to be asked to do, but the rules don't apply to me and what I want to accomplish. This is the Roman official, Julius, who is there. He's with this military entourage. He wants to get to Rome. He knows it's not sailing season, but he thinks because he's an important person, he should be exempt. Let's set sail out into the storm. A fourth way that people respond to making difficult decisions, this is delayed acceptance. This is Paul's shipmates, weeks out into the stormy seas when they recognize, wow, this is a big deal. And this is really going to impact me personally, going to have a big effect on my life. I had this personal experience back in March when the world locked down and everything stopped. I really naively thought, Man, it's like a hurricane. We've been through emergencies a couple of weeks, and the churches will be all back open. Everybody will go back to work. Somebody will blow a whistle, and normal will just come back. And then March, April, I was thinking, well, surely we'll be back all together by Easter. And then Easter and May and Mother's Day and Memorial Day weekend. And, and early in June, there's the news of the surge from Memorial Day weekend and corona cases and everything's still locked down and curtailed. And, and I'm in this room here in the worship center. I'm in a planning meeting with, a, with a Pierre and Cindy. And, and Cindy says, oh, we're going to have vacation Bible school for the children in the summer of 2020. And I'm, my head is starting to get around this. Never before have I ever entertained we're going to curtail or cancel church events. No, we can't do that. And, and I, I started to realize, and Pierre can tell you, in a moment of clarity behind the mask, behind myself, I looked at Pierre and I said, we're not going to have vacation Bible school. In fact, this is a big deal. And this is going to go on. This might even impact how we do Christmas. Or God forbid, Easter. Delayed acceptance, like it or not. A fifth way that people um, react to a crisis of making a difficult decision is, um, this is, a, is disruption. Life is forever turned upside down and I recognize that my life will never be the same. This is Paul and the fellow passengers on the boat. Can you imagine? 
They're watching the crew throw the ship tackle over into the ocean. You kind of get the idea, we're not going to get to Rome, are we? <laughs> no. Our schedule's been disrupted. Everybody, every, everybody, come on. I'm not the only one. We're all right there. We've got tough. You've got tough decisions that you have to make. The kids are, school is, the business is, my relationships, will we travel, will we visit, our financial decisions, the choices of priority. Got to deal with it. How do I make difficult decisions when none of the options are really preferable? That's disruption. And that leads to distress. A lot of people are distressed today. It's going to last and I don't know what to do. And now then, the seventh way to react to difficult decisions in a crisis. And this is my goal today. To help you get to where I feel I've finally arrived in all this mess. That seventh stage of reacting to the difficult decisions that a crisis puts upon us, let's call it determination. The determination that just knows that with God's help and grace, no matter what the situation, we're going to get through this together. And you will too. That we will escape the denial, the disillusionment, the defiance, the delay, the disruption, the distress, and come to Christ in determination, absolutely assured, that we're going to, with God's help, God is not finished yet, and we're going to get through this. And do you know what the quality of that determination is? It's the essential quality that God wishes to plant and nurture and inspire in everybody whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life today, and that's simply called faithfulness, no matter what. And how do you make this difficult decisions when the world is flying apart all around you? Look at Paul in the midst of the storm, so confident, so reliable, so faithful, standing before his shipmates at the brow of the storm as the waves are, are raging all around him, and he says to them the gospel message true. If we are to survive, you've got to stay in our boat. And when I think about that, it starts to make me more sympathetic to people around me, people that have different points of view, I, it's, you know how the days are today. We're so polarized. You say something to one person, they pat you on the back. You say the same thing to the next person, and you've stepped on a landmine, and there's an explosion. We're so polarized, so many different opinions. I just come to realize through this story, and I hope you get it too, that people are just at different places in processing the crisis and the difficult decisions that they're in today. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants me to tell you this morning, He wants you to get to that seventh level of determination, a realization that no matter what the difficulty is, God's grace and help will get us all through. So stay in the boat. How does real faith work? How do I get real faith? That helps me to make tough choices easily instead of being bogged down in denial and dismissal and defiance and disruption and distress. Real faith, it starts by simply asking God for it. The Apostle James says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should pray and ask God. Because God gives it generously to anyone who asks. He never resents your asking. God loves to help you. He will give you the wisdom that you need. Loving God, living God, hearing, acting, feeling, loving towards you, wanting to interact with you. Beautiful gospel message. If you want real faith, just ask. Just ask God first for the wisdom of God to be at work in your life. For the wisdom of God to be at work. 
Proverbs 24, 14 promises, get God's wisdom and you'll have a bright and secure future. Proverbs 24, 14. Aren't you ready for that? Um, number one, if you want real faith that will get you through the crisis and make decisions easier for you, number one, ask God for the wisdom that you need first before you go to default, denial, despair, defiance, delay, and distress. How do I get the wisdom that I need to make the decisions easier? Ask God. Number two, then take God's advice. That means make Jesus Christ first priority in your life. That will be the wisest thing that you'll ever do in your entire life. Top priority. You're it, God. Thought, schedule, money, relationships, right on down the line. Now I treat other people. Listen to Psalms 111, verse 10. Reverence for the Lord is the foundation of all true wisdom. The rewards of wisdom are given to anyone who listens and obeys. Three quick words. Reverence, foundation, true wisdom. Oh, let's put a fourth word in. Reward. Reverence. Uh, make Jesus the top priority. Reverence, what is reverence for the Lord? Reverence, reverence is, of course, respect and honor. But it's respect and honor for me personally because I trust Jesus Christ and know that he's reliable. Reverence for the Lord, I trust God. That's my foundation. That's the foundation of all true wisdom. Having Christ as your foundation is the wisest thing you can ever do. And what are the rewards? Well, of course, eternal life in the Lamb's Book of Life. But right here and now, in this world today, for you, real rewards today. Real rewards of wisdom. Um, instead of living in denial, dismissal, defiance, disruption, and distress, you can, as Paul, begin to have a reputation of stability and reliability and confidence and influence and be, come to be seen as a person of faith. How do you get real faith in your life? Ask God, make Jesus first, and then put God's word into practice in your life. Put God's word into practice in your life. Quite frankly, I'll make it real simple. The only part of the Bible that you actually believe is the parts of the Bible that you actually live. Make God's word the center of your life. Real wisdom makes God's word the center of your life in word and in practice. And in practice means in your relationships with how you talk about God and to God, how you talk about others and to others, and how you talk about yourself to yourself and to other people. Relationships redefined. Remember now, remember, my overall goal today is to get you through all of those six conflictatory stages so that you can make, by faith, difficult decisions easily because you are determined to recognize that God is faithful and that you can be faithful and that with the help and grace of Jesus Christ, we'll get through it all. You'll get through it all. You'll get through it all. And then the last thing, I want to say one more thing about getting real faith in your life. Once you know, you've asked, you believe God's word, you use God's word, follow God's wisdom, then get yourself in the boat with God's people. Get in the boat with them. This is not a Lone Ranger show. Sail the storm with other like-minded believers encouraging one another. Psalms 13.20 says, If you keep company with wise people, you'll become wise. But if you hang out with foolish people, you'll suffer from making bad choices. Get in the boat with God's people. 
Let me ask you something. Are the people that you regularly associate with in your life, are they stress busters or are they stress generators? You need to get in the boat with God's people. People you can associate with and you do associate with, they start to influence how you, uh, the choices that you make. And the quality of the choices that you make define who you are ultimately. Get in the boat with God's people. Somebody say, well, I've been told to stay at home. Oh, don't, don't, don't. come on. The boat is bigger. I mean, uh, go to the Little Avalay's website and you're going to see all of the fellowship opportunities that are still being a, 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 a offered to our congregational family. Zoom classes, live stream events, invite somebody over, have an inspiration night in your own home with your closest friends and families, uh, 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 watch an inspirational video from the Avalay Entertainment Network. We call that the Right Now Ministries. And, and, there's so many ways to still be connected, to really be wise about things, to really recognize that there's determination that leads to faithfulness, that recognizes through it all, no matter what, with God's help and grace, we'll get through it. Paul said, you've got to stay in the boat. And here's something that, that really is important to me, and I'll wrap it up with this right here, that once you get this kind of real faith that makes Difficult choices, easier. Once you get this kind of real faith, this God wisdom going in your life, it will relieve you of being a double-minded person. Suffering with constant regret. There was no clear option, and so should I have done this, should I have done that, if I'd only done it this way, if I could do it over again, I'd do it that way. And regrets are torturous. The psychologist has a patient in, and the patient is talking, going around in circles. The psychologist spontaneously says, are you an indecisive person? There's a pause, and the patient responds, well, yes and no. <laughs> I used to be indecisive, but no, I don't think I'm indecisive anymore. What do you think? It's torturous to live like that. God's wisdom put into practice in your life as daily decisions will allow God to go to work on your behalf. And if God is working upon your behalf, then even if your decisions aren't perfect, even if you settle for something secondary, God can come in because of your pure heart and redemptively, the word is redemptively, redeem what you have done, work on your behalf and cause good to come from it. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. Big faith, big blessings. Little faith, little blessings. God's not moved by your whining, crying, complaining, or griping. What moves God, what moves mountains, what breaks down barriers, what rolls away the blockades is when somebody will have faith enough to trust in God first and start to live the belief that no matter what, God will get us through. It's time to stay in the boat because we know no matter what that God causes everything to work together for good to those of us who love him and are called to live his purpose. Look one more time at the faithful Apostle Paul standing in the prow of that boat out on the stormy waters. An hour of crisis and division, decisions, poor decisions all around him. Is it storm season? Is it sailing season? Denial, dismissal, defiance, disruption, distress. People are polarized in every way. But in the midst of that storm, they stopped, they paused, they saw Paul standing there. The embodiment of determination, of godly wisdom, of faithfulness being proclaimed with complete confidence. The only way you're going to get through this is if we all Stay in the boat together. And that's wisdom. And that's how faith makes difficult decisions easier. A memory verse for your encouragement. Reflect on this just this week. 
all week long. James 1, 25. If you look intently into God's perfect word, that gives you freedom. And you continue to do this, not forgetting what you've learned. And then you will put it into practice in your life. You will be blessed in everything you do. Are you ready to be blessed in everything you do? Are you ready for that? You can have that promise today. I want you right now to think about a big major decision, a difficult decision you're going to be faced with right now. I don't mean a difficult decision that somebody else has to make. I mean you. A difficult decision that you're going to have to make right now. And as you get that decision out there in your heart and on your mind, I want you just to offer it up to God. I want you to give that decision to God right now. And I want you to pray with me our prayer. Dear God, I want to trust you with my life by putting you first in my life. I want to trust you to give me the wisdom I need to make better decisions. I'm asking you to help me have your wisdom through your word and through your people, through our circumstances. Guide me, Lord, and direct me. Help me to make wise decisions. And then, Lord, I'm asking you to help me trust you in every little area, knowing that I don't have to second-guess myself, but just follow you. That you will give me the faith and the power to stop torturing myself over decisions. Because I know that even if I made a second-best decision, you're going to bring good out of it. Thank you for that comfort. Thank you for that assurance. Thank you for being the living Lord God of heaven and earth. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you that you work in all things for the good of those called according to your purpose. Everybody say amen. Friends, God is working for some people, looking for some friends who will remain faithful to the end of the crisis. He will call them his people. Be encouraged to die.